Adele Levine had gone through a series of dead-end jobs, a period of depressing unemployment. Then she thought, I'll study physical therapy. It's not too hard and has reasonable hours. Little did she know that she would end up working at Walter Reed Military Hospital at the amputee clinic. With the advances in body armor and medical care, more soldiers survived the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but their limbs sometimes did not. Walter Reed became the world leader in amputee care. Adele and her colleagues worked on getting those wounded soldiers up out of bed and walking again. Her memoir is called Run, Don't Walk, and Adele Levine joins me in the studio. Adele, welcome. Good to be here. You went to physical therapy school thinking that you'd be treating people with lower back pain and tennis elbow. You ended up at an amputee clinic. How did that happen? (laughs) Well, it wasn't really planned, but I had just moved to D.C. and I was signing the lease on a new apartment and it happened to be across the street from Walter Reed. And my landlord pointed it out to me because she knew I was a physical therapist and she just asked me if I was working over there. And I was like, well, no, but, you know, maybe I should. So that's when I started looking for jobs at Walter Reed. And And you thought that would be just really convenient. It's right across the street. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, (laughs) in D.C. you're always looking for an easy commute. But, uh, yeah, I was completely unprepared for what I was walking into. And uh, I still remember the uh, first combat injury I saw and, and just how blown away I was by it. I remember feeling like, I remember feeling my heart kind of speed up and I felt like I was sort of having trouble breathing and I was surprised by my reaction because I always thought, you know, I'm kind of hard to rattle. And I couldn't quite put my finger on what was so upsetting about it because I had seen bad injuries before, you know, certainly in PT school. And uh, it was because I'd never seen anyone before who'd been kind of deliberately and maliciously hurt. Most of your patients are very young fit men um, in their 20s. What condition are they in at the point that they're ready to start physical therapy with you? Oh, they start right away. We start seeing them in the intensive care unit. When we were at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, they would usually get there within three days of their initial injuries in combat. Uh, They would be airlifted, you know, from the combat support hospital, known as the CASH, to Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany, and from there they would uh, continue on to Andrews Air Force Base where they were picked up by Army medical ambulances that would then take them to Walter Reed. From Germany, they would send an email listing the casualties that were arriving. And so by the time they got to Walter Reed, they had the ORs all ready for each of them. And they had a physician assigned to them. They had a hospital room assigned. They had everything prepared. They would start PT pretty much as soon as they woke up. But they're not ready to start moving at that Stage. Oh, they started moving. I mean, the only days we didn't do physical therapy and occupational therapy uh, were the days they were having surgery. So we would go in, evaluate them, see how well they could. I mean, in the beginning, you're not doing a lot for sure, but we still want to know, you know, can you roll in bed? Can you sit up on your own? Um, can you lift your leg up? I mean, just little things. And you're not trained as a counselor. No. <laughs> but sometimes they wanted to talk to you about what happened to them. Oh, sure. How did you deal with that? Well, it's definitely not my specialty. You know, I have a coworker who's just great at the pep talk. But uh, uh, I mean, the only thing I could offer was just, just, I guess, um, the routine of me. You know, that I would always come when I said I was going to show up. Given the very depressing nature of having these young, healthy men, mostly men, some women, losing their limbs, their lives changed forever. Did you ever get depressed? Yeah, I mean, it just, it got overwhelming sometimes, especially when we were seeing so many patients. You know, you you felt like you couldn't really give everybody what, what you, you couldn't give them the amount of time you felt like each person needed. And so I I remember even seeing some of my coworkers crying just because they just got so frustrated. But, you know, while we were in the clinic, it was always a really cheerful and upbeat place to be. You know, people are always joking and teasing. And your book's not depressing at all. No, I hope think not. <laughs> it was, given the topic, it would be kind of a downer, but it's not at all. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Talk about the interaction of the soldiers in the amputee clinic at Walter Reed. Oh, well, they were always, I mean, it was a real kind of barracks mentality. You know, they'd be in there, they'd be teasing each other about, they would call each other ugly stump or princess if they were having a lot of pain. Um, 
they always referred to uh, Walter Reed as just another day in paradise. And they all wore these T-shirts um, like Marine 25% off or uh, I had a blast in Afghanistan, um, Stumpy. I mean, they always had, or I'm just in it for the parking. They'd have like a handicap symbol. So they were, they always um, had a good sense of humor about things. And that totally rubbed off on the staff. The memoir we're discussing is called Run, Don't Walk, The Curious and Chaotic Life of a Physical Therapist Inside Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Adele Levine is a physical therapist and an author. She's uh, in the studio with me. It's going back how this, about how it impacted you personally. Um, at one point you started having nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> I guess about a year after a year after I'd been in the amputee clinic, I just started having these terrible nightmares where every night I would just, everyone in my dream was an amputee. And it was always, I was always surprised by it. Like it was like my parents or my sister. Or sometimes it was me. And um, I got really worked up about it because I felt like, you know, you know, I'm dealing with it all day at work and then at night too. And so I, <laughs> I told my coworkers what was happening and they all kind of laughed it off. They're like, oh yeah. That happens to us, too. So this is common. Yeah, it was common. What triggered it? Do you know? Uh, I, I don't know what triggered it. I think it was when I saw my one patient when he amputated his second leg. Then I, I started, wanted to ask you yeah. about him. This is Cosmo. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about him. Well, first of all, for because of patient privacy laws, I had to uh, really conceal the patient's identities. So for Cosmo, I took three of my patients who I felt had very similar personalities. And that became Cosmo. They were, um, you know, he was very rebellious. Uh, he was... Used the F word a lot. Oh, yeah. He was always <laughs> dropping the F bomb. And uh, <laughs> he also, um, he was kind of the, the type of patient I would classify as a difficult patient. Um, not because of his injuries, but just because he was never going to do what I wanted him to do. And so there was always kind of like a lot of friction there. You would think you would really want to participate in the physical therapy because that's what's going to get you moving and 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 back not to your normal self but at least oh yeah I always wondered you know you know if I was a patient you know would I be like Cosmo would I be like blowing everything off and being a total rebel or would I be the kind of patient that's in the PT clinic you know five hours a day working out um, but you know I thought I I always thought about that, and I think my coworkers did too. We were we would always compare. Well, if, you know, if it happened to me, I'd be working out all the time. But I don't know. And Cosmo's mother didn't like you very much either. Oh no, not a friend. Why? Um, I don't blame her because uh, she was angry, and so she needed someone to be angry at. So she called you pain and torture and Bloody Mary. Yeah. <laughs> and did you interact with the families very much? Yes. I mean, they were always there. And uh, the military has this interesting uh, thing with, that they call a non-medical attendant, where they actually pay a family member or a friend um, of the uh, of the patient to stay on and act as their kind of care provider. And so they would participate in physical therapy. They were, you know, expected to escort the patient to and from appointments and help with medications and things like that. The book we're discussing is called Run, Don't Walk, The Curious and Chaotic Life of a Physical Therapist Inside Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Adele Levine is a physical therapist and an author. Cosmo had an amputation and then a very badly mangled leg. After a while, he took the decision that he wanted that other, that second leg amputated. How did he come to that decision? Um, it was... You know, in the beginning, we were seeing a lot of patients like Cosmo, where one leg was, was gone from the blast, but the other one was just barely attached. And uh, they tried really hard to save the other leg. You know, the surgeons did. Um, but it was, it was often, it was just so painful for the patient, and it was never quite functional again. So many of them decided later on to, to have their second leg amputated. And uh, Cosmo was one of those guys. Um, he just, uh, it just gave him a terrible time. I mean, he could barely move from his wheelchair to his bed. I mean, just moving around when you have a leg that's, you know, in, you know, 10 different pieces and held together by all sorts of external steel rods is just, 
no way comfortable. Was he happier after the second yes. amputation? Yes. And actually in the book, I said it was his choice, but he always wanted his leg off from the beginning. But the surgeons really wanted to save it. There have been some really amazing advances in prosthetic limbs. Um, how hard is it to learn to walk on those? I mean, they're not easy to walk on. Even the most uh, technologically advanced leg um, isn't going to walk for you. I mean, they're heavy. I mean, uh, just imagine strapping a manhole cover to your leg. I mean, they're heavy, um, and you can't feel the floor underneath you, and uh, they take a lot of energy just to move around. So, for example, a bilateral above-knee amputee will spend 60 to 300 times as much energy as their able-bodied counterpart just to walk at half the pace. Um, what these, what the more advanced uh, prosthetics do do, though, is they make it safer. So if you're walking, and and when, if you're walking on a on an artificial on a on a leg that has an artificial knee, um, it's it's really hard for you to control when is the knee going to be straight and stable for you to weight bear through it, and when is it going to buckle? I mean, obviously you want it to bend when you want to swing the leg through, but you don't want it to bend when you're shifting your weight onto that side. So the computerized knees can sense, you know, when they should be stiffer and when they should be releasing the knee to swing through. And I understand it's harder the heavier you are. Well, sure, because you have to, you have to bear that much more weight um, on a smaller, on a, what we call the, technically the residual limb, but, you know, in, in the amputee section, we called it stump or nub or whatever you, you know, crude word you want to use, but uh, it's, uh, it's not easy. And the, a lot of balance is involved. Oh, sure. You can't, feel, you can't feel the floor underneath your foot. I mean, we can. If we step, like the sidewalks all have a, all sort of tilt toward the road, and that's not something I ever noticed before, but it's something that my patients would notice immediately. And also, when you're walking on a prosthetic leg, um, if, if you've lost your knee, obviously you're walking on a, on a artificial knee and an artificial ankle. The ankles never really move all that much, so they're pretty stiff. So if you're walking, if you hit an incline, um, the ankle isn't going to give for you like our ankle would. Some people think that, you know, with these prosthetic limbs, you can learn to do everything that you did before. Running, hiking, rock climbing. Is that true? There are certainly amputees who do that. I mean, and but it really depends on, on your level. Um, your so, physical ability? Well, also your amputation level. I really feel like a, there's nothing a below knee amputee can't get back to doing. So, I mean, it's going to be a little more awkward for them if they were to walk up a steep incline, again, just because their ankle isn't going to have that much motion in it. But they can go back to running, biking, doing all that. And so can above knee amputees. The difficulties at Walter Reed were that our patients, not only were they missing one limb, they were frequently missing the other limb, or they had bad injuries to the other side, or they had bad pelvic fractures. I mean, it wasn't just that they had an amputation. Cosmo eventually gave up on trying to walk. Why? He just felt like it was much less energy consuming for him just to use his wheelchair. It, you know, he could easily get across space in his wheelchair, but, it, you know, to walk across space was just, you know, a sweatshop. Yeah. So he just wasn't interested in trying to prove himself that way. And that was disappointing to you. It was. It was. Um, because at the time, I was really kind of caught up with, uh, you know, we sort of classified how well our patients were doing by whether they were walking or not. You know, and of course, in the amputee clinic, we wanted everybody to walk. And if they weren't walking, well, then, you know, maybe they weren't doing so well. But actually, you know, the longer I was there, the more I started to change how I how I judge success. And I really feel like Cosmo was a success because he did go back to his life and he was living his life. Um, he was out there. He might not have been walking around, but he was certainly participating. And that's what I was worried about because I felt like maybe if he, um, if he just accepted his wheelchair, he would have a harder time because it is hard to get around in a wheelchair. I mean, Adele Levine is in the studio with me. She's a physical therapist, formerly at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Her memoir is called Run, Don't Walk. You're listening to the Mimi Gerga Show. We're on the web at mgshow.org. What was the worst amputation case you ever saw? I saw a patient who his 
uh, he had a very short above knee amputation. So his, his leg was amputated at the thigh, but very close, just a few inches below his groin. And the other leg was, was amputated at, at the hip joint. And then his arm was gone above the elbow, um, high above the elbow. He just had a little bit. So he really just had one arm. And he also wasn't an American patient, um, so he didn't speak English. And uh, he was at Walter Reed pretty much by himself. Um, it, was, it was very sad. It was really hard to work with him because um, we didn't have a translator. Uh, and we were relying on Google Translate. And um, Can you tell us what country he's from? Uh, he was from Romania. These are one of the... Um, Coalition yeah. forces, as it's called. Yeah. That's why he's at Walter Reed. Yes. I would think it's hard for you, after dealing with such hard cases, to then treat somebody that's got a sore ankle. Oh, I kind of like that stuff. Because <laughs> cause I feel like I can fix it, you know? I'm like, oh, this is something that can get 100% better. So, But I know some of my patients who see me, um, who, who know my background, feel a little awkward. And of course, you know, if they were missing a leg, I probably could help them a lot more. I'm sure, so. <laughs> you know, you, you sometimes get the feeling of, oh, come on, you know, buck up. This isn't so bad. It's just a sore ankle. Yeah. Yeah. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. You had a lot of visitors at the amputee clinic. Who are some of the more notable people that came by? Oh, my God. We had so many people come. I mean, every day people came. We had Harmed Karzai come, Tim Gunn. Stevie Nicks came all the time. John Stewart came frequently. Um, we had, of course, my favorite, Reno 911, come in full costume. We had the New York City Rockettes come a few times, and they always, they also would come in full costume in their sequined leotards and their high heels. <laughs> They'd be walking around the clinic. Um, but my favorite visitors were always just the local people who just decided just to drop by and at the old Walter Reed, um, you could just come in if you had a uh, driver's license. And the patients liked that, or did they feel like they were being gawked at? Um, well, we worked inside a Glaston rehab clinic, so they led tour groups around the perimeter um, in addition to the visitors. So, I mean, I think the tour groups we would all kind of joke about that they made us feel like we were in the zoo. Or for me, I always, because I swim a lot, it made me feel like I was in an aquarium. Um, but a lot of the visitors, you know, the patients really enjoyed. So especially if they were cheerleaders or, you know, like the Rockettes, that was a big hit. Typically, how long does a soldier stay at Walter Reed? Um, they would stay anywhere from six months to four years. And this is, um, I know it's an exception, but you did encounter some people that were just milking the system. Oh, sure. I mean, Walter Reed, in addition to treating, you know, really severe orthopedic injuries, also worked as kind of like a large workman's comp facility. So, I mean, everybody who was kind of injured in Afghanistan or Iraq who had kind of an orthopedic injury was sort of processed through Walter Reed. And then um, if it wasn't severe, they were kind of sent back to wherever they came from. Um, or if they needed further rehab, a lot of times... You know, if they came from Texas, for example, they would be sent on to Brook Army Medical Center, or if they were from San Diego, they'd go on to Balboa. But um, but we had a lot of people who didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay where they were. They didn't want to go back to their National Guard unit or, or things like that. So the amputees, when they left, what was their psychological state, so to speak? Were they optimistic about their lives, or did they just feel forever changed? I guess, I mean, that's such a personal question. You'd have to ask each one of them. But, you know, some I, I just sort of feel like it really boils down to your own personality. And some people are more positive to begin with. And, uh, you know, some people are a little more on the negative side. Um, but we did have guys come back who we always classified as, you know, really positive, fantastic guys who are going to just do fantastic. And some of them came back and, and admitted that they had really dark days when they went home. And that shook us up. And as the wars progressed, did you see the injuries get worse oh, or the, better? The, oh, the injuries got much worse. Why? Well, for, for several reasons. And this is just my personal opinion. But um, one, 
we were seeing a lot more injuries coming out of Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, everyone was on foot patrol. So instead of driving over an implosive device in, a, in an armored vehicle, they were walking across it. So they were just getting blown up. Um, the other thing is I, I suspect that probably the, the bombs got deadlier. And uh, the third thing uh, is I think the surgeons and the, and the combat medics just got much, much better at saving people who otherwise would have died. You know, when we see the numbers of this many soldiers killed, this many injured, they're just numbers to us. But when you write in your book, for instance, last week we got three triple amputees, this week three more, that's shocking to me. It was shocking to us. So we had a coworker who was deployed. When she came back, she just she just couldn't believe it because in that one year she had been gone, the injuries had tripled. So, and we were just like running like gerbils on a wheel. It's not something that we really think about here, even no. in the Washington <laughs> no. D.C. area. No, you know? no. I mean, one of my coworkers put it well. Uh, she said that this is our generation's war, but that it affects very very few people. And not many people are aware of what's happening. And affects them drastically. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I think a lot of times these young sh- soldiers sign up and they think, you know, I'm either going to come back a war hero or I'm going to get killed. They don't really think about being a triple amputee. No. As a possibility. I know. I, I, I would ask them sometimes, you know, did you, I mean, were you scared? Were you worried? Because I would be scared. I'm such a nervous Nelly anyway. And once I had a nightmare that me and my coworker Darcy were deployed. We were running around like, oh my God. But uh, yeah. And your caseload typically was 10 to 15 patients a day? Yes. And that's just you. Right. So about how many amputees typically are there? Well, you know, by the time Walter Reed Army Medical Center closed, uh, we were relocated to Bethesda. We were seeing about 150 amputees a day, or close to. And new ones coming in every day? We had new ones coming in and uh, some leaving, but there was a lot of overlap between those coming in and those getting ready to be discharged. What is your ultimate goal for each of your patients? Oh, I would just like to see them, you know, get back to participating in their life, whatever that would be. Some of them kind of decided to just withdraw and you saw a lot of them spending time with violent video games trying that way to get back into their lives into their old lives yeah well that was one thing that Cosmo did that just made me nuts why um I just thought that was not a a, I didn't think that was a good way to uh de-stress or whatever you know to play these violent video games and lock himself up in his room for hours on end and then you know, have terrible PTSD later because of it. Um, but then later he told me that he was actually, I mean, I didn't know this because I don't play these games, but he was doing it on Xbox Live, so he was talking to his buddies and doing it, you know, with friends. So then I felt a little better about it. But he just, I just felt like he was such a loner and it would be better for him to, you know, actually be out there, you know, talking to people. I want to ask you about one more patient. You had um, a high level, apparently Pentagon person, come in with a prosthetic, and he was not walking very well. Oh, yeah, he walked terrible. (laughs) You said that was an ugly walk or something like that? Yeah, (laughs) I forgot. Oh, he was doing the wedding march. Right, so he was not swinging his leg forward. He was stopping and then moving one at a time. So you, I think you hadn't realized who he was. I didn't know who he was. But he came up to me, and he said he was going to get the new X2. This is the fancy leg. Yeah, it was this new leg they were trying out. And uh, I guess someone pointed me out to him because I'd had a few patients learn the X2 while I was still kind of a prototype knee. And uh, he wanted to know if I thought it would help him walk better. I said, no way. You know, I'm like, you walk. (laughs) I said, you walk like you're wearing um, a, a peg leg. Like a pirate. Yeah. Yeah, and he was, he was so appalled, he couldn't believe it. But, I mean, I didn't know who he was. So anyway, so he went and he got his X2, and he came walking back, same way as before. I said, see? I was like, you're walking no different. And you helped him walk better. Well, <laughs> temporarily. I mean, when he left, he was walking a little better. I don't know if that stuck. But 
you know, again, you have to you have to do the homework. You have to do your physical therapy. You want to walk well, you have to do the the work. It's not going to just happen. And if you walk like if you walk badly in some old school knee, you're going to walk just as badly in some upgraded knee. What do you want people to take from this book when they read it? Well, <laughs> I was actually in Barnes and Noble looking for my book and I couldn't find it and I looked all over the store and I got pretty depressed about it and then I found it it was in the medical section like turned in so it's surrounded by all these like GI books you know colon cleansing books <laughs> and uh, I don't I mean I know it's about a medical subject it's about um, amputations and physical therapy um, and it's it's about an army hospital, but I really would hope that my book would have some universal appeal because it's about people going through a, a hard time, and it's about overcoming difficult situations and about many, many different people coming together and working together and about the power of humor, you know, and how with a you know, good sense of humor you can kind of overcome anything. The memoir is called Run, Don't Walk, The Curious and Chaotic Life of a Physical Therapist Inside Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Adele Levine is the author and a physical therapist. Adele, thanks so much for being on the program. Oh, thanks for having me.